I thought about the theme of faith and faith. Where do you see that in Christmas? Anybody have any ideas? Where do you see faith or faithfulness in the Christmas story? No answers. How about from the people of the Christmas story? <laughs> and in fact, common people with extraordinary faith. That should encourage us because we're common people ourselves. And so what I'm doing, I it was just read to you at least a good part of the text, and I'm going to read another one later on, but the Advent theme for this week is that of faith or faithfulness, as I said to you many times. But And I said this last week. How can you remember each week? Just remember that verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I think uh, it's verse 13. So it's 1 Corinthians 13, 13, where it says, And now abideth faith, hope, and love. These three. And the greatest of these is love. So, faith. Next week, hope. Then the third week, love. And then the fourth week, the, the uh, Sunday just before Christmas, it will be joy. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. And that's an appropriate... Uh, and, I, and I admit that different denominations have their different themes for each week, and usually those are included. But we come to that time when we celebrate. We begin to celebrate. I didn't have to start today. But we begin to celebrate officially the advent of Jesus Christ into this world of ours. Think about how extraordinary that must have been. The long-awaited Son of God to appear in the flesh. To appear in the flesh. Remember, there hadn't been a prophet in Israel in 400 years. But then finally, the day arrives. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, says John. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. What a thing. So, if you have that thing that needs to happen, that event in history, then it would demand, it would demand a lot of miracles. A lot of miracles. Many miracles would need to take place ushering in the Lord Jesus Christ into his earthly pilgrimage. Now, we could talk about the miracles, but there's a, another slant that I want to put on this subject, especially faith and faithfulness. Something we often overlook when we think about the Christmas story and getting a reaction or a lack of reaction, my thought was right on target. My thought is this. When God performs great miracles, who does he choose? He chooses common people, ordinary people, like all of us, to be part of the extraordinary, ordinary people, doing extraordinary things, and it's all because of faith and faithfulness. Now, why does he do that? Why doesn't he get the king? Why doesn't he get the high priest? Why doesn't he get somebody like that? Why does he get common people? We're told why in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. God has chosen the common people. I'm paraphrasing now. But God has chosen the common people like us to do extraordinary things that he may be glorified, right? That's why. That's why. No one can claim any goodness or any greatness being able to do this or that. So such was the case in the Christmas story. The characters chosen by God to witness these miracles were like all of us. They really were. Now, when we think of some of them, we think, oh, no, no, they were so holy. They were so holy. Well, they became known as holy people. But at the time when it all happened, they were ordinary people. In fact, in some, unfortunately, in some denominations, they even just about worship some of these people. 
and that's unfortunate. It wasn't meant to be that way. So I want to talk about just two, just two of the many characters of the Christmas story. These are the prominent ones for sure. The first one is Joseph. Joseph who trusted and obeyed. <laughs> you know, he's often overlooked in the Christmas story. You know, he, he didn't do much except for obey the angel and take Mary to Bethlehem and try to find her room. What else do we know about him? Well, it says in Matthew chapter 1, 18 through 25, Matthew 1, 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Wow, that could be a disappointment. And then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph. Now, now put, try to put yourself in, that, in this whole occasion. It'd say that you were just standing by watching it all. What would that be like? An angel of the Lord said, Joseph, son of David. He had to be of the Davidic line. Do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Okay, there's some words there that they probably had no idea what that meant. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And he will save his people from their sins. Now, that, that okay, that could make a little sense. So all this was done that might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold the virgin, this is Isaiah 7, 14. Behold the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Now what did Joseph do after he got all of that revelation, that dream? I, I was more than a dream. And more about that in just a moment. But it was more than just a dream. We've all had, you had dreams last night. But this was a little different. Then Joseph, being aroused from his sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her. There was no relations, physical relationship. But he took Mary as his wife and had no relationship till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus, which means Savior. Now, to be betrothed at, at that time, it was a serious matter. <laughs> it was a family affair. It was a family occasion, a family planning situation. There's no question about it. To be betrothed there was not like the engagement that we have today. The engagement that we have today is, well... It's meaningful, yes, and it, it, there is a commitment, but it's often broken. It's often broken because it's not as deep and binding as what we're talking about here. The families were deeply involved. This was a plan, and it went on for a whole year. We forget about that, you know. He was, they were betrothed. I wonder when the angel came and all of that. Probably near the end of the betrothed period. Because uh, right away she became pregnant with the Holy Spirit. But anyways, they, they had matters to deal with. Families would get together and they'd decide who's going to pay for what and how much dowry, if it was necessary, would one family have to pay to the other family. Certain dates would have to be set, and they were in stone, let me tell you. Not like they are today where they can be changed. And it was a year's period. So there are a lot involved here, a lot involved. And Joseph was a, a tremendous man, a man of faith. And here he was asked to Keep Mary 
don't get rid of her. Don't put her away secretly. I know that's a noble thing to do. But the angel says, here's what I want you to do, Joseph. Go ahead and marry her. This is from God. Go ahead and take her to be your wife. He probably thought, oh, this, is, this could be disgraceful. He didn't say it. But he, by the way, he, he um, didn't want to, it to be a public thing that she became pregnant because she could have been stoned to death. That's in the Old Testament law. You know, you have sex outside of marriage, you're, you're done. And today, that's not the case, but that's how, how serious it, it was with God. Fornication is a very serious thing, but it's so common today that people don't even, you know, blink an eye. They don't, they don't think anything about it at all, like they used to, or like they did him, here. But God had a plan in all of this. It wasn't going to be fornication. It was going to be uh, an impreg impregnation of the Holy Spirit into her. We don't understand that. We never could have imagined that, but that's how it happened with hindsight. But God had different plans for this couple. He wanted to send them to Bethlehem because they were going to be counted in the, in the census by the emperor in Rome so that they could tax everybody properly. But it worked out for good, right? We sometimes resist change. We resist this or that. And all the time, God wants us to go through it by faith because the Messiah had to be born in Bethlehem as to fulfill a prophecy, Micah 5. It was a wonderful thing that, that what, what happened. And God even used the emperor in Rome. He didn't know he was being used by God, but he surely was. But Joseph had this dream. The angel reminded him of Isaiah 7.14. Talks about the virgin giving birth to a son. His name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And Joseph woke up and he said in so many words, Yes, sir, I will... Do what you want me to do. I will be faithful to that. I don't know about you. Uh, this must have been some dream, but it would have to take some dream for me to do what Joseph did. How about you men? It would take some dream. So this was not an ordinary dream, not at all. Our son-in-law, had a dream similar to this, not maybe this. Uh, we shouldn't compare our dreams that God gives us with, with Joseph's because they probably don't measure up. But my son-in-law or our son-in-law had a dream. He says the Lord woke him up. He was, he was taking chemotherapy. He had a tumor in, in his uh, brain right in the middle of his brain it had to be removed and I don't want to get into all that but it was removed Cleveland Clinic in, uh, in Cleveland the one that's in Cleveland and uh, then he had to go back to serve his country not in the military but as a civilian in England where he came from with that tumor he went back to work but he had to take this chemotherapy as a, as a maintenance thing cleaning up the cells that might be swimming around in that vacuum that had been created there in the middle of his brain. And he had to often sleep on the bathroom floor because it would make you sick. And the Lord, he said, woke me up. He woke me up one night. And he helped me up and he took me to all the rooms of the house we did. I told you this story before, but for those that didn't hear it. He took me to all the rooms of... of the house that we were living in, three floors of rooms. They were living in Harrogate, England, and right in the middle of England. And he, he would say to me, push open the door. I pushed it open. He said, you are healed. Take me to the next room. 
push open the door. Push the, open the door. You are healed. All of these rooms he went to. And each time the Lord said to him, you are healed. You know why the Lord did that? Who knows, except two days later, a woman came up to them and said, I don't know, and you don't know me, but I have something that I feel God wants me to tell you. And they said, what? And she said, you are healed. And he was healed, and he is healed, even to this day. But that, that's the kind of dream where Brandon, that's his name, Brandon thought, this, this is the Lord. I am with him. You know, that's how real it was, that he was awake, walking around the house, pushing doors open. And so, thank God that he does that once in a while, even to this day. But Joseph had a dream like that, even more profound. It had to do with the Savior of the world. And Joseph was a man of faith. He took God at his word. He didn't make excuses. You know, he just was beside himself in many ways. The next person, the last person, is Mary. Joseph and Mary. Now, Mary, who desires to serve God, the young lady just wanted to serve God. By the way, this happened before Joseph's dream, actually. I just wanted to do Joseph first and then Mary last, and you'll see why I'm going to spend a little bit more time on Mary. Luke 1, 26 through 38. Now, in the sixth month, of the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, the virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, well, here's another visitation of an angel, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed, is, blessed are you among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at this saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob, or Israel, forever. And his kingdom, there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I don't know a man? I had no relationship with a man. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest shall overshadow you. So this is the second time this kind of impregnation is, is mentioned. Therefore also the Holy One who is in you will be born and be called the Son of God. Now indeed Elizabeth, your relative, also has conceived in a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. The angel says, for with God nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Mary was a remarkable young lady. Just picture Mary. You know, people were shorter in those days. Did you know that? A lot shorter than we are today. In fact, people that are coming along after me, I notice they're bigger than I am. They're growing fast and real quickly now. But they were shorter. She probably was about five feet high. And they're about. And she was about 15 years of age. That's pretty young, but that was normal in those days for marriage. Tremendously connected to the Lord. It, it was almost as if when she got this visitation, she was not startled so much as, as she started talking to the angel. Favored or chosen by God to mother the Savior of the world. She was real in that she asked proper questions. She was not ridiculed at all. 
by the angel. Simply, the questions were answered. She, she had asked a question like, what's go going on here? I mean, I'm, you're asking me to be a mother, but I don't even know a man. How can I be a mother without a man? And the angel explained what's going to happen. In Genesis 3.15, it says, The seed of the woman shall crush the head of the serpent, Satan. The seed of the woman, Genesis 3.15, seed of the woman shall crush the head of the serpent. Notice there's no man mentioned there. Normally we would say the seed of the man, you know. Normally you would say, well, he's from the seed of Abraham. So on. Only a woman here. Only a woman. Because the Holy Spirit is taking the place of the man. The Holy Spirit is the seed. So the seed of the woman. Now, she was the woman. She was the woman. And after the angel explained how this was going to happen, I'm sure she didn't fully understand it either, how this pregnancy was different, she simply said, I would have said, you're going to have to explain that a little bit more to me. <laughs> well, she did. She said, well, let it happen. Let it happen to me according to your word. That's faith. She didn't ask any more questions. That's faith. Think for a moment about the character of this young lady. Her selection by God, well, she had to be of the house of David as well. So did her husband, and that was taking place. She, they had to go to Bethlehem. That would be taken care of later on. But there could be a lot of women that would fall into those categories. And there could only be one Mary, though. There could only be one mother. She must have been very, very special. Her sanctity, she was holy. She was harmless, undefiled. She was totally committed to God. Her submission was unwavering. It was very humble. A great woman. A great woman. And she says later on, concerning her service, she's meeting up now with Elizabeth. The angel said, by the way, your, your cousin, it was probably her second cousin, your cousin Elizabeth, he's pregnant too. And that's another miracle because she was barren and she's old. So I want you to go to her. That would comfort Mary. Here's two miraculous births that were going to take place. They're even related. One's John the Baptist, one's Jesus. But it says in Luke 1, when she comes into the presence of, of Elizabeth, uh, Luke 1, 46 through 55, then Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. You see, the Holy Spirit is upon her. She's prophesying this. She's not just coming up with a sermon here. She is anointed by the Holy Spirit and co coming out of her mouth are words that God has given her. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly estate of his maidservant. No, notice that. Lowly estate of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. That's a prophecy that literally still happens today. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imaginations of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones. He has exalted the lowly. See, it was lowly. He has filled the hungry. She was hungry for spiritual things. He has filled the hungry with good things. And the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. And he spoke to our fathers and to Abraham and to his seed forever. Abraham and his seed forever. Can you imagine a better choice than Mary? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think there was. She is remarkable. 
and the Lord has honored her just as he said he would. She's honored throughout the world. She's honored all the time throughout the world. When we uh, visited Ephesus about a year ago now, before we went to the ruins of Ephesus, the tour guide took us up into a canyon. We go, where is he going? Took us up into this canyon, which was probably about 10 miles away from Ephesus, into a high mountain. And we stop at this house, and that was Mary's house in her later years. That's probably where she died. Wasn't in Israel. She died in Ephesus. How do we know that? Because John, the apostle, said that he would take care of her, didn't he? Remember at the cross? Well, he wound up in his last days ministering as pastor at Ephesus. Then he was exiled to Patmos later on, you know, and back to Ephesus again. I didn't realize that until I had gone there and the, and the, and the man told me. But before he was exiled, long before, Mary died. And that was her house. We were going to go into her house. And do you know the original house still had a foundation on it about two feet, three feet high? And they simply built on it to complete it because over 2,000 years, it's probably going to come down. And it did. But, you know, it's marvelous. They wanted to kill her in Ephesus. That's why he took her up there. And they wanted to kill her in Israel, and that's probably why he took her out of there. A lot of that speculation, we don't know the, all of the ins and outs of that, but that makes a lot of sense. Why else would they be there? Well, God is still looking for young women and men, like these two, like these two, who possess a simple, childlike faith. You know, a, a simple childlike faith, that's an interesting term. A simple childlike faith is extraordinary faith. Think about it. If you want a definition of an extraordinary faith, use a child as your example. Because a child, I mean, God said it, I believe it, and that settles. <laughs> so God said it, and don't you believe it, you adult? If God said it, we must believe it, right? That's the way a kid thinks. And that's the kind of faith we need to have. But we don't often. We find reasons, and uh, we, you know, there's a whole lot of garbage that has come in that has messed all that up. But he can do great things with a young person, such as Mary and Joseph. And may those kinds of people lead this church in, in the future, I tell you. It's often that God uses young people to bring about revival. If you read the history of revivals, often young people are used. The last great revival that I know about that really happened in this country of, of, of great magnitude was, was the revival down in uh, Asbury College in Wilmore, Kentucky. In 1972, I believe it was. And it started with the college students. And it spread to state to state in that southern area there, Kentucky, Tennessee. He can do it again. When any one of us is constantly abiding in Christ, like these two were, the miraculous is bound to happen. Miracles are going to take place. And we need miracles. For miracles to happen, we need to have that childlike faith. Humble, trusting, obeying, broken, and poured out for God to use in any way that He wants to use us and do anything He wants to do through us. And it would be to God that He would select people from this church, young people especially, from this congregation to bring about that. So, those are just two of the people. <laughs> Two of the common people, the ordinary people who did extraordinary things for God. Part of the Christmas story. Let me pray. Father, thank you for Joseph, 
Thank you for Mary. Thank you for their example. They weren't perfect. No, they were not sinless. For even Mary says, I rejoice in God my Savior. She needed a Savior. But Lord, they were people of faith. A childlike faith. A simple faith. Help us, Father, to be like-minded, like-hearted. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.